You see, our topic is tonight, tonight, I thought I'd pick a light topic, about relationships, like Pastor Aaron. If you listen to Pastor Aaron, he does relationships best. You listen to his sermons he's been doing this month, they're so good. I, I want to speak to your mind, and I want to talk about the theology of the body and sex. I'm a theologian. And so listen, here's where we're going to go tonight. I want to do about a 20-minute talk of a Christian TED Talk, okay? I want to speak to your mind. I want to talk, and you may get a little bored, but I, I'll try and keep it, like, engaging. But then about... 20 minutes in, I'm going to go for full prophetic. That's my gifting. And I, Anybody here last year when I spoke, when, man, Holy Spirit broke out. It was a power. What, how long? We worked for like an hour afterwards, just people just seeking the Lord. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to go full prophetic. Then for about the last 10 minutes, I'm going Pentecostal. We, I'm telling you, for you who are new or who you don't know any of this Christianity thing, it, buckle up. That's all I got to say. So, uh, Okay, a couple things. I have a podcast, okay? I'm going to do a 20 to th- or 30 to 40 minute talk, but my wife and I have a podcast, Radical Christian Life with Doug and Paula, and starting not next week because we're finishing up a marriage two-part series, but we're going to do a three-part series, maybe four now, on the theology of the body and sex. And we're gonna, we go a lot deeper in that. So if you kind of like are interested in what we're saying, listen to that podcast. And uh, it was actually great because... I wanted to finish the last series today and record it today. And my wife, in her loving way, kind of messed that up. But see, that bro, that was a good one to pick. Number one, he quoted Romans 8.28, all things work together for good. Now, women, I just want to let you know, number two, you didn't notice this, but I did. He had on one of my wristbands that... Any bro that has a donkey on his wristband is a guy you should probably want to date. So I'm just throwing that out there. But anyway, number two, I'm shouting you out for having that SBB wristband on. But anyway, there you go. So, uh, uh, but we're going to put in the podcast when we record it, a thing that didn't get up there. And it's going to be on social media. We're going to try. I want to put some resources out there because you're going to hear about sex and all this stuff tonight. And it's like, great, but what do you do when you're tempted on Friday night? What are you doing when you're struggling with who you are on a Saturday? You know that. So we're going to put some resources in your hand. I think, Pastor Zane, and we might be able to put those names out there because if you've never heard of Rosario Butterfield or Christopher Yuan or Linda Saylor, these are people you need to listen to if anything I say tonight is sparking interest in you. Now, where this all started with is Pastor then asked me, I think back in November, and I started seeking, and I read parts of one of the greatest theology books ever written in the history of Christendom, and it was written just about 40 years ago by Pope John Paul II, and it's called The Theology of the Body. I don't expect you to read it, but I'll put some resources of people who break it down for you, because it's a tome. You college students, though, what's another book to you, right? But I really want to help you change your thinking about who you are and what sex is all about. So pray with me, please. God, if you're not in this, this will be just a TED Talk. But if your spirit moves in our hearts and through my mouth, you can change all our minds to see you more clear in who you are and see ourselves in the reality of how you created us. So God, I pray May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. And all God's people said, amen. Okay, let's go. Now, I want to give this famous C.S. Lewis quote. If you never heard of C.S. Lewis, he was a famous theologian about 80 years ago. And this is a great quote. He says, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling around with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us. Like, ignorant chi- like an ignorant child wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he can't imagine what is meant by an offer of a holiday at the sea, we are far too easily pleased. And I want to speak to those tonight who you're making mud pies in the slums. God wants to offer you infinite joy. I got your attention. 
I want you to listen to this quote from T.S. Eliot. This has been a splinter in my mind. Any Matrix people in here? Oh, you're not that old yet. But anyway, that was a, mo- that was a movie made a long time ago, right? Uh, but it's a splinter in my mind. The first time I heard it, and the author, this woman who wrote this article I read, she said it was a splinter in her mind when it comes to the idea of sex and, and our bodies and that. And it's this. Before you know if something is working, you need to know what it is for. And I thought, man, that is so good because I get questions all the time. I mean, if you've ever heard me talk, I'm a little edgy sometimes. I I like to speak about things you're going to talk about in Starbucks, you're going to talk about when you're hanging out. I'm willing to say that from the stage. And everybody's like, you know, like, why? Why why you're talking about it? You know, uh, you know, we, we did the EXO marriage conference and we've been censored because I just get so like, what do you mean you can't say those words? You all know what they mean. We get it all the time. How far can we go? I love people in dating, you know. How far can we go? Is petting okay? Can I go second base, you know, third? Woo, you know, his aura. Oh, okay, I won't say it. I'll stop right there. Now, I know somebody's going to write Pastor Aaron a letter. Some mother's offended right now because I say it. And I apologize. But I'm speaking to the 90% of you who've actually seen porn. And it's messed you up. And I'm so tired that our people are learning about sex from their friends and from pornography instead of hearing it from the Word of God. So that's the idea I'm coming from. So I, so I really, it's not a, those are the wrong questions. When people ask, how far can I go? Can I masturbate? Can I do these things? Are they sin? I'm like, wait, that's the wrong question. It's not what can I do, it's what is it for? So that's what I want to explore tonight. I want us just to think and I, I want to talk. So the question is, what is our body and what is sex for? Okay, do I have your attention? Yeah, yeah I got to do a say. Sex people are like, what? <laughs> Relationships, dating, I'm going to teach you how to die. I met my wife at 15 years old. We had sex. We were messed up. I got saved. She got saved. We had to quit having sex. I didn't like that, so I married her at 19 years old. I don't know anything about dating. I'm not going to tell you about relationships. You want to have sex? Get married. That's the only thing I know. But I wish I would have learned what I'm teaching you tonight at a young age. Now, for some of you, you're not Christians. You've been invited here. You're like, what is did I get myself into? Okay, let me just to give you a disclaimer. I want you to see this mathematical equation up here. What I'm going to say tonight to some of you is going to sound like 2 plus 2 equals 5. You've been so conditioned by the culture. You've been listening to all these professors and people on the college campuses who are just telling you a bunch of things that when you come into a church and start hearing what the church says, it's going to go, what is he saying? This is as nonsense as 2 plus 2 equals 5. Let me give you some examples of that. Like, like a man becoming a woman. That's just accepted. That's just, but in the church, we're like, what? What? A man becoming a woman, what are you talking about? If I would have said that 20, 30 years ago, people would have said that's nonsense. I'm a missionary. I travel all the world. I've already been to Asia. I've been to the Middle East this year. I'm getting ready to travel again next week. I'm always traveling the world. When I go to these places and and they're going like, what is going on in America? To them, it's still two plus two equals five. But to us, we've just accepted these things that, what are we talking? A man can become a woman? homosexual marriage. No, I say homosexual unions, all that, but homosexual marriage, that's an oxymoron, if you know what marriage means. But as soon as I even question it, I mean, you know what the world's saying, like, what are you talking about? Of course that's accepted. Everyone, we have a law that says it's okay. And then another one, gender fluid. What does that mean? To me, that's two plus two equals five, but I know if you've bought into the world, that's just normal. No, Doug, you're the one who's seeing two plus two equals five. Because the difference is, and this is where I just want you to understand, if you believe those things, it's it's because your foundation is on the world. That's what you built your worldview on. And it's the world. And I'm not mad at you. I'm not here attacking you. I'm not saying those people, you know, let's throw them out and be mean to them. No, no, I'm going to tell you actually why I treat you with dignity if you disagree with me. 
And I hope you can respect where we're coming from because my worldview and the church's worldview is on the word of God. So I just recognize, and that's all I'm doing, a disclaimer. I recognize this might sound like nonsense to some of you. But just hear us out because this is what the church holds to. But I want to tell you why. Now, I want to blow your mind on some things. So I'm going to give you four things that hopefully, you know, I used to do drugs back in the day. I was going to put a big marijuana leaf up here just to like, you know, like, whoa, man, can't believe he said that. And here's the first thing I want to blow your mind with. Sex is not what you do. It's who you are. We've changed this word. A hundred years ago, if you said to somebody, yeah, I had sex last night, they'd say, what? What, what do you mean? No, you had intercourse last night. No, you had, oh, no, you had eight. You, yeah, you had, you did. I, I, I didn't say it. I can't get in trouble. But see, those are sex acts, we say. Those are acts. Those are actions you do. But that's not what sex is. Sex is who you are. And I'm going to explain that in a little more detail, but I just want to put that in your mind because that's just like, oh. Because all we want to talk about is what we do. We don't want to talk about who we are. But if we know who we are, then what we do makes sense. So let's start with the foundation that we hold to, the Word of God. And there are two verses, just two verses tonight that will literally... In the 21st century on college campuses and in corporate America and stuff, it is literally two plus two equals five. It's just like mind exploding. When you say just two verses, the first is Genesis 127. And God made man in his own image. In the image of God, he made him male and female, he made them. Wow. That's a crazy verse. Is that true? And then if that's not crazy enough, it says later on in Genesis 2, 24, it says that, and the man shall leave his mother and father and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one. Wow. Wow. Really? Is this true? There was a historical Adam, there was a historical Eve, and they were made in God's image. And then God told those two male and female to come together and be married. Whoa. Now, let me give you a little theology. Any foundations people in here? Yeah. If you go to Radiant Church and you haven't taken foundations yet, get to it. You need to take it. And you need to know what you believe and what the church has historically taught. We don't fight over minor things, but we hold the line on major things. And one of the major things we hold on to is the Word of God. Now, if you know anything about what's going on in the church, the church broad, they are attacking the book of Genesis like nobody's business. It's mythology. It's not true. You go and take one of your Western Civ classes in college, they'll just tell you it's just another ancient book. It's just a bunch of stories. It's not really historically true. There was no Adam and Eve, didn't you take biology? Don't you know uh, genetics, Doug? And it couldn't have come from just a one man and a woman. It had to come from a pool. Don't you know evolution has told us we've just, we're just monkeys and we just come up the most racist, racist theory ever invented in the history of the world is atheistic uh, evolution. And yet people are buying into it right and left. It's horrible. I hate it. I won't I will have nonsense and I will stand it because the word of God says that there is a Genesis and there is a man and there is a woman and they have dignity because they're created in God's image. That's why I'll expect some of you to come up and yell at me, call me a bigot, call me a homophobe, call me all this and that. And that's fine. I'm going to love you. You know why? Because you're created in God's image. But if you think I came from some tadpole and came out of some primordial soup, you may kill me because I have no worth in your eyes. So you got to think through the conclusions of what you believe. You're probably going, man, I wish I had a joint right now. <laughs> but here, let me mess up the church. 
Let me mess up the church, because if you think that and you call yourself a Christian, well, Doug, I take evolution. I've studied biology. I've studied that. And, and I believe, no, we did come out of soup. There was no historical anatomy. And Eve. You have a problem if you call yourself a Christian. Why? Because that means you're a follower of Christ. That means you believe what Jesus said. And guess what Jesus says in Matthew 19, 4 and 5, when he was asked about marriage and divorce. What does he do? He comes up with his own theory. He just makes up an idea. No, Jesus, the son of God who died for our sins was raised on the third day. You know what he did? He quotes Genesis 127 and 224. Those two verses, Jesus affirmed. And he even says that there, in the beginning. Do you see what he says? How it goes, in the beginning, he made them male and female. The beginning, because he knows Genesis is the foundation. And if you take away the foundation, hey, go have sex. Go do what you want. Go become whatever you want. Pick your gender. Pick this. Pick that. Because you're now the master of your destiny, not God. And I don't want to be that person. I hope you don't either. So let's go back. So two plus two equals five. The world, pick your gender. The Bible, there are two genders. The binary, male and female. The world, you came from soup. So your dignity comes from you, not from anything outside. The Bible, no, your dignity, your worth comes from... Did I say something messed up? Everyone laughs. So. <laughs> I usually say one thing. My wife's over there just shaking her head. So. The Bible says, no, you are created in God's image. You have dignity and worth from him, not from yourself. And third, God created marriage. That's why homosexual marriage doesn't make sense to me. Homosexual unions do, and that's fine. I'm not going to sit and throw stones. But, but you can't say marriage because marriage came from God, and God said it's between a man and a woman, a male and female, and he brought them together. So, again, that's not like we're homophobic. No, it's just saying what the church says, and we stand upon the word of God because that's what we do. So, I mean, what am I supposed to do? Choose the world or choose God? Well, I either have to give up my faith in Jesus Christ or I have to obey what he says. So, blow our mind number two. You ready for number two? The Bible says that you are a sexual being, either male or female. I love this quote by George Orwell, author of 1984. If you know anything about that, we're living in 1984 right now. Dystopian society that's coming. We have sunk to the depth where the restatement of the obvious is the first duty of intelligent people. That's another, what did he just say? We have sunk to the depth. We're to the point in society that instead of reaching great heights, instead of being all that God wants you to be, instead of exploring the great things that God has for us, we've sunk to the depth where we have to restate the obvious, that you're a man or you're a woman, and we have to fight those battles. And we wonder why depression is up and suicide is up. And if we don't even know who we are because of the lies of the world. Now, let's go back to T.S. Eliot's question. To know if something's working, we have to first know what it is for. So what is the body and sex for? Okay? Three things. First, creation. Procreation. Sorry, procreation. Genesis 128, after Jesus says he made the male and female, he says, now go be fruitful and multiply. Go have babies. Go have sex. Make babies. If you've never done a deep dive into the sexual revolution of the 1960s and how it changed everything, then you're probably a little naive in what's going on in our society. I love the book, uh, and it's part of the resource that uh, Pastor Susanna is going to put on social media, or you can listen to our podcasts. Carl Truman wrote a book called The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self two years ago. It's one of the greatest books, I think, in the last 20 years written. And he explains how this started back in the Enlightenment period to get us to this idea of removing the shackles of God and, and the authority and just doing your own thing. And, and now we're seeing the fruit of it. And, and one of the things that came with it is technology. See, before when you had sex, you always had to worry about having a baby. But now you can have it for free. Take a pill, do that. And if you do have an accident, you can just kill it now. Abortion is just simple. See, we want sex without the consequences. And that's a horrible way to say it. No, we want sex without the blessing. Because now we're meeting more and more people. Paul and I meet more and more people who want to get married, but they don't want to have children. Oh, society's so bad. Oh, so you want the, you know, friends with benefits? You want marriage without the benefits. You don't want to take the responsibility. You just want the sex without becoming a man or a woman. Because part of being a man and a woman is creating a family. 
Well, good, thank you. You're not going to write a letter against me. Thank you for that. Okay. But that's not it. That's not even the main thing about marriage. The number two thing is union. Not just procreation, but it's about union. To represent the triune nature of God. See, in Genesis 2.24, when it says, it says, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one. Echad in Hebrew, they'll become one. That word one is also the same word that's used in Deuteronomy 6.4, the famous Shema that all Jews say, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is Echad. The Lord is one. Wait a minute. Male and female are one, but there's two persons. Wait a minute. God is one? Yes, with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Take foundations. We believe in one God, not two, three gods. We believe in one God, but that God eternally exists in diversity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And when we come together as husband and wife, we represent this union that we become one. My wife and I are one flesh. We are together, and we represent mystically Christ. We represent the Holy Spirit. And we represent the Father. And if that's not wild enough, the third reason that Paul really emphasizes the mystery of marriage, the mystery of why we're created with sex, we're created as sex, to represent Christ in his church. I'm not going to read it because of time, but Ephesians 5, 22 through 33, it's a, every married couple has to study it. We preach it all the time. My wife represents the church, okay? That's what the bride does. She represents the church. The church is to receive the initiator. Now, let's get weird for a second. You want to get weird? Yeah. Okay, when we talk about sex, I represent Christ. Christ is the one who comes. Christ is the one who initiates uh, marriage, I mean, the, the wedding feast of the, the church and Christ. And that's what it is. So think about sex with a man. A man has sex outside himself. This is getting weird, but just hold on. You're a, hey, let's practice some adulting, okay? You can giggle a little bit, but that's right. A man comes, go, comes outside himself. I said it, okay? There you go. Yeah, outside himself. It, it does. He penetrates his wife. I know it's going to do it, but he just does that. A woman receives it. Think about this, women. You, you're ultimately in the act of sex. You receive it into your body. In fact, the result of sex takes gestation inside your body. And in fact, your body then starts to lactate because your body is made to nurture and take care of that child. That's sex. That's what sex is for. It's representing this mystical union that Christ is going to come and take us to be with him forever in his kingdom. I can't wait for that. Now, here's where the Catholics get some things right. I'm not Catholic. I'm not pro-Catholic in that sense. But I'm not a thrown stone thrower either, okay? You can be a born-again Catholic, and you can be a born-again Baptist. You can go to hell Catholic and go to hell Methodist. You know, that's, that's, the denominations are great, but it's about Jesus Christ that his blood shed and died for your sin. But the Catholics got some things right. And, and this idea, the sacraments. Now, I don't believe sacraments give you grace. You know, they run to church every Sunday and get the communion so they can get grace, and then they go out and commit hell Monday through Friday, you know? No, that's not what... That's not what Sacraments are for. Sacraments are supposed to be physical representations of a spiritual reality. So when we take communion, come to church March 17th. I'm preaching and doing communion. It's going to be amazing. Anyway, that's a radiant plug. I got to do a shameless plug. But anyway, when you take communion, you're representing the death and resurrection of Christ, his body and his blood. When you're baptized, you're representing the spiritual reality that you have died to your sins, you've died to your old self, and you've been raised to a new life. There's physical, spirit, there's physical representations of a spiritual reality. Marriage is a physical representation of a spiritual reality of you becoming one with Christ. And we get so weird when we have to talk about sex. Why? Because we've perverted it. We've made it dirty. We've made it something that we're supposed to whisper if it was a marriage context, I'd be a little more open about my wife and I's... No, I wouldn't, but anyway. Yeah, <laughs> my wife just yelled, no, you won't. Are you staying with me, though? I mean, is this something interesting? I, at least I... Okay. I know some of you want to stand up and go, no, sit down and shut up. But anyways, Jesus loves me, okay? I know that. 
Blow your mind number three, right for it. You ready for it? Because I know what most of you are thinking. Yeah, this is great, but I'm single. Now, I'm not married. What does this all have to do? Well, let's blow our mind with number three. Really? Really? We kind of give little mixed signals in the church, you know, like, hey, it's cool you're married. Stay faithful. Stay good while you're single, but kind of just wait until you can get married. You know, it's kind of like, okay, we say you're not second-class citizens. We say it all the time, but do we really... Do we really, really believe that? Or is there something special? Look what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7 1. Now, concerning the matters about which I, you wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. It's good to be celibate. He goes on even more in 1 Corinthians 7 8 and says, To the unmarried and to widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. If you're single and you're content in that, you're more spiritual than I am. Because I practice the next verse where Paul says, it is, if you cannot control your desires, it is better to marry than to burn. And at 19 years old, I realized I was going to burn really bad. So I did what men do. Men, hear it up. You don't go out like a dog and start having sex with people to relieve yourself. You don't sit in front of the computer screen at night and just because you want to get happy and do self-gratification. You be a man, you take a responsibility, you court a woman, you win her heart, and then you lead her to Jesus Christ and marry her. It's not rocket science. I'm sorry your parents broke up. My parents divorced. My dad was not good. My dad was a horrible marriage. We had a horrible marriage, treated my mom wrong, ran off, affairs, all those things. No excuse. I know marriage is hard. It is hard, but it's worth it if that's what God's called you to. But if not, but if not, take the higher calling and be single and embrace it until maybe God brings you somebody or changes your heart. Let me read this quote by Peter Kreft, man. This is this quote. He's one of my favorite Catholic theologians. This isn't being recorded, is it? <laughs> this could be the end of my career. I will go back overseas and stay there. I'm okay. <laughs> Listen to this quote. If I... Now, suppose you saw a book with the title, The Sexual Life of a Nun. You would probably assume it is some scurrilous, gossipy sort of story about tunnels connecting convents and monasteries, clandestine rendezvous between, behind the high altar and masking a pregnancy as a tumor but it is a perfectly proper title. All nuns have a sexual life. They are women, not men. When a nun prays and acts charitably, she prays or acts, not he. Her celibacy forbids intercourse, but it cannot forbid her to be a woman. In everything she does, her essence plays a part, and her sex is as much a part of her essence as her age, her race, and her sense of humor. Blow our mind one more time. So the ultimate fulfillment of your body, why you were created, male and female, why we have sex with, as a male or female, is union with Christ. Amen. It's about union with Christ. So there's two things you, single people need to really understand. Married too, but first embrace who you, God created you to be. I really feel bad for you women. The world is trying to beat it out of you that women is not being good enough. You have to be a man. You got to compete with men and you got to act like a man and you got to be a man. And I'll just give you one example, okay? This is offensive. This is going to offend you. I know it. Please, forgive. it's not wrong for a woman to play, sock, uh, to play hockey. Listen to our podcast. We do a whole thing. We are not defined by our roles. You can be a woman and be the toughest thing and, you know, be a policewoman and all that. That's fine. That's a role. That doesn't define you as a male or female. You can be a sensitive guy who cries at the notebook and all those things and you work in a, some kind of job. That doesn't make you less of a man just because you don't like MMA and get in fight. That doesn't have nothing to do with male and female. Those are just societal roles we put on people. But if you're not a man who wants to provide and protect, then you're not a man. I don't care what your job is. And if you're not a woman who wants to nurture, who doesn't want to think children are an inconvenience, children are something to just, you know, put up with until you can get on being who God wants you to be, 
You don't understand what your sex is. You don't understand what you're created for. Embrace being a woman. Love, your, love the way he created you. Love being a man. You know, you got to apologize now for being a man. You know, I am the enemy. You get that. I'm a white older male. I'm like the evilest of the evil. You know, I'm supposed to walk around in shame and guilt. No, you know what I am? I'm a child of God. I don't care what color my melanin is. I don't care what color your melanin is. Why are we letting the world define us and making you all confused? And I don't say this joking. I don't say this. I say this with weeping. To not know if you were born in the wrong, right body. Listen to Linda Saylor. She is an, I, we'll put that, uh, her book, Transformation, her podcast, she, her YouTube story. She believed that. She believed the lie. She was born wrong. And her struggle, and now she goes to college campuses and helps sets people free to embrace how God created you. Yes, there is confusion. But this is what being a Christian is all about, to get back into reality and in your right mind. And that's where joy comes from. So first thing, first thing is just embrace who you are. Okay? The second thing. And the second thing is, don't live for just the physical. Don't live for just the physical. Because what happens is, oh, I'm just going to get married so I can have sex and everything will be okay. And you wonder why marriages are falling apart. You wonder why, oh yeah, I'm having sex. I, my favorite, there was a famous actor, and, and he had this hot wife, you know, hot wife. And he was a good-looking guy, hot wife. I mean, hot, whatever hot means, she was hot, you know. <laughs> And he got caught with the ugliest prostitute you can imagine. And you're like, bro, what are you thinking? See? This doesn't satisfy marriage, looks, all that stuff. I'm not saying go find somebody ugly to date. That's not what I'm promoting. <laughs> but if you're dating only for looks, if you think sex with just, is that's it, you're not living for a higher plane. You're living for the base instead of the greater thing, which is union with Christ. Okay, I'm, do I'm over. Can I keep going, though? Because I got to read this quote. Yeah, please. Hey, I t I'm used to people getting up walking out on me. It doesn't offend me. Yeah, you got time. But you got to hear this quote from Bud uh, Szeski. He's a Catholic theologian. Speaks a lot on college campuses. Well, he's old now. He's probably about to die. I don't think he's doing that. But <laughs> Listen to this quote, and I'm going to break it down for you. Okay, ready? It's not up on the screen. You're going to have to listen. Christians need to learn that the second good is union, what I just said, union. In marriage, sexual union takes each spouse out of the self for the sake of others. Solidarity sex can't achieve this. It keeps you locked in self. I, I actually watched, okay, excuse me, I, I get a little graphic here. On the plane ride home uh, from the Middle East last week, I, I sometimes scroll and see what's on TV because we don't have a TV, and uh, I was watching, and there was this um, HBO I don't know about that Netflix, HBO. I would just say don't get a TV. But anyways, we do watch Amazon Prime movies, which if you want any sick rom-coms, ask my wife. She can tell you them all. But there was a show, and the guy was talking about how the greatest masturbation is the greatest sex you can have because you know how to please yourself better than anyone else and just promoting that. And girls, you need to understand, this is unfortunately why guys won't marry you because they'd rather sit in front of a TV or computer screen and live in a fantasy world and actually be a man and take the responsibility of trying to please you because he knows it's vulnerable and you'll probably hurt him because part of marriage is just being vulnerable and getting hurt and trying to work through it and love each other through it that's why you don't marry a non-christian because they're ultimately selfish but but a christian but a christian should know now i'm not saying they do but they should know they've been bought by the blood of jesus christ and they're supposed to be a servant to their spouse well i'm preaching aren't i <laughs> Homos, homosexual sex can't achieve this it directs you narcissistically to a mirror image of yourself that's why it's homosexual union but it's not marriage because a man can't penetrate a man the way it's supposed to be and if you think they can then you got a sick warped view of sex sorry I just I'm just saying yeah. same with two women they can't penetrate each other unless they use foreign objects and stuff it's just it's just not it's just narcissistic. It's not representing the union, and that's what ultimately sex is supposed to represent. 
Ready for the next? Neither can casual sex achieve this. It endlessly joins and severs, joins and severs. I wonder how many of you are here because you're trying to pick up somebody. And you hear what I'm saying, but man, if you can get into her pants this week, you're going to. Hey, if this guy's going to love me enough, I'll put out because I might get a husband that way. I know what's going on. I'm not naive. I might be 60, but I'm not naive. <laughs> they were having premarital sex back in my day, too, and I had it. And it's wrong. You just have to hear it. Why? Because just what he says, listen to this. Imagine what it would be like to repeatedly tear off and reattach your arm. There would come a day when no earthly surgery would suffice. And unitive power of your body, your, it, the unitive power of your body would be lost. It is the same if you repeatedly tear off and reattach your various, with various sexual partners. Eventually, they all seem like strangers, and you just don't feel anything. You have destroyed your capacity for intimacy. You know anything about prostitutes? You ever talk to a prostitute? It's not about intimacy. It's about an act. It's about an act. It's not about love. Sex is supposed to be with love in a marriage covenant. And when you go out and you have sex with somebody you haven't made a covenant with, what you're doing is you're losing a little bit of your intimacy. And then you wonder why you feel a little lost or a little despair or a little lonely or a little bad. This is what's great about being a Christian. Jesus can redeem everything you've done. He can change everything in your life in an instant. And that's what he did from her. My wife and I had sin. We had horrible evil in our past. But because we became believers in Jesus Christ, we accepted the blood of Jesus Christ that changes us and made all the difference. And we got restored. So 42, 42 years later, we are in joy. We are in love. Because of what the Lord has done. Amen. That's why you become a Christian. <laughs> okay, I'm done teaching. Whew, man, this, just love me. Love me through this, Susanna. Love me, people. Again, if you got to leave, I get it. i got to go to bed soon. <laughs> I should say with my wife, but that's a joke. But anyway. <laughs> I want to speak to the men. This is especially for the men. I had this... I'm trying to be spirit-led more this year, and it's really working amazing. We all talk about being walking by the Spirit, but I'm really trying and, and listening to when the Lord prompts my heart to do something that I believe he wants me to do, like righteous things, I know it's the Lord, and I'm just going to do it. Okay. <coughs> he wanted me to show this video. I showed it to the team, and they're like, uh, yeah. <laughs> but I had a... I don't want to say a vision. I don't want to get too mystical, but I had a word from the Lord to show it and then explain it this way. I have confessed why I like this video. This is one of my favorite videos of all time. A, I love fail videos. Anybody fail video people here? Yeah, go Army. Go, go, go Army fail, whatever that is. Yeah, I, I watch them all. My two favorite, the woman stamping the grapes and falls over. Ooh, ooh, ooh. That's a... But that's not funny. That's not a fail. That's an accident. We shouldn't really laugh at that. And I, I repented of that one. I won't show that. That's bad. We shouldn't make fun of somebody else an accident. But this one, this one I laughed at. This one I like. This is my, one of my favorite fail videos of all time. Okay? Ready? Let's show it. You guys okay? <laughs> Thank you, team, for the bleeps, because uh, <coughs> you can imagine what they said when they landed. You watch it, you're like, what were they thinking? You're standing on a roof, one holding the other guy upside down, and you jump on a table? What are you thinking? I wonder if heaven right now, the angels are gathered around the TV and they're watching your life. Bro, what are you thinking? Why are you sleeping with her? You could have eternal joy with God and you're doing that? 
girl, what are you doing? What a fan. Why are you getting drunk? Why are you taking a chance of losing your, your virginity, getting drunk with these people around you? What are you thinking? You may be that fail video because you wanted to live for the world instead of realizing you were created for something better, union with Christ. And so this is the game changer for single people. You say, I am going to embrace my marriage with the Lord. I am the church, male and female. We are the church, and I am going to live for him. I am going to be pure for him. I am going to focus on him. I am going to spend my free time serving the church. I am going to spend my free time ministering to people who need it. I'm not going to be some narcissistic, how can I get my needs met? How can I get my feelings met? That's not the way of Jesus. Jesus came to serve. I'm going to be a servant of Jesus and serve others. That's the marriage you're supposed to have. Man, that'll preach, right? Hallelujah, let's go. But I know that's great on a Thursday night in church. Woo, yes, I'm going to do it. But then Friday night, uh, the temptations come. The urges start to... Uh, the body's like rebelling against your mind. Uh, yeah, Part of the union with Christ is realizing what Jesus wanted to do when he left. Jesus wanted to redeem your sexual life. He wanted to redeem your sex, to embrace you as a male, to embrace you as a female. And he knows that you can't do it. So the question is, how do I control my body and sexual temptation? How do I control that? And let me tell you right here a little secret. You ready? I'm going to write this down. You can't. You can't. And so many of you realize right now, you have an inner hatred of yourself. You don't want to say it. You want to be macho. You want to be cool. You want to be, yeah, I'm cool, uncle. But inside, you're dying because you know you can't control it. You hate yourself. You're like that story of the guy who was, this is an old, this, now think about how old this was. This was a guy who got a Playboy magazine. I mean, what's even Playboy magazine? We got porn on our phone. This was back in the day when a guy with a porn uh, magazine, he looked at porn and he self-gratified with it. And then he hated himself for doing it, like when you, you know, how that is. And so, so you, you're just, I'll never do it again. And he took the magazine and he burn it and put it in his sink. And an hour later, he was trying to go through the ashes to see if he could see another image. Because you know this pull. I'm never going to do it again. I'm never going to do it. I'll never sleep with another person. I'm, I'm going to wait for marriage. But then the temptation comes and you go back to it. And so many of you, you know exactly what I'm saying. You've never shared it out loud. You've never admitted it to anyone. But you can't control it. You go back to the computer screen. You go back to the computer screen, and you don't want to, and you hate yourself. And then you wonder why you're depressed. You wonder why you can't feel victory. Because I'm going full Pentecostal because there's only one way. Because the one who wants to ultimately marry you, Jesus Christ, said, I, John the Baptist said, I baptize you with water, but there's going to come one who's going to baptize you with fire and the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and you will never have victory until you are baptized and filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus says in Acts 1.8, he says, but you will be, but, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And the only way you can defeat these sexual temptations, you don't defeat them, you put them in the right perspective. You can control it. Don't listen to the lies of the devil. You don't have to have sex. You can grow in maturity. Yeah, you may stumble and fall. That's right, but Proverbs 24, 16, the righteous fall seven times and rises again, but the wicked stumble in times of calamity. So I'm not talking about some perfection sexual life. You're going to still struggle with it, but you can have victory. You can have victory victory and power in Jesus' name if you've been filled and baptized with the Holy Spirit. But have you? Have you? I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? If you don't know, you don't know. And that's why you're still living a non-victorious Christian life. You can live on a spiritual plane, not the physical. Remember this, people. Remember this. 
You are a spiritual being with a body. You are not a body who just happens to have a spirit with you. You live for the higher plane. You live for a kingdom to come. You live in the spiritual realm. You don't live in the physical, earthly passions I'm bound to. I should have brought it, Paul. I should. I bought, literally, I bought a ball and chain. And I was going to preach holding it, but I thought that would be kind of weird, you know. But, but so many, you're still bound, you're slaves, because you've never received the power of the Holy Spirit. And I love what Galatians 5.16 says. Listen to this verse. But I say, walk by the Spirit. Once you receive the power of the Spirit, you walk by it, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Here it is. That's how you do it. How do I control myself even that? Even with my wife and all that? I still have urges. I still get tempted to look at things. I still have an internet connection. I mean, it's always there. You're never going to just be like, oh, I'm never going to, I can put so many blocks on. I can do so much accountability partners. Good, do it. But that's not ultimately going to give you the victory. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. Because how many of you, when you've been baptized by the Holy Spirit, you start living for Jesus. You forget yourself and you live for him and you start living for others. And I don't have time for sex because I'm too busy married to the one who's all of me and he's going to take me into his kingdom. So do you want to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit? Everybody stand to their feet. Okay, I don't think we're going to be able to have people come forward. So I'm going to go old-fashioned. I'm just going to, yeah, I'm not going to call you forward. This is going to be different. See, I want to tell you, I, I, I heard Catherine Coleman, if you never seen an old, interesting woman. But I love this. She goes, you can, only, you can only preach what you've experienced. So many of you, you've been taught that if baptism with the Holy Spirit is supposed to be some emotional thing where you fall out and you speak in unknown languages and all that, and that might happen to you. That's great. But that's not the power of the Holy Spirit. Power of the Holy Spirit is just like salvation. It's something you receive by faith. And you believe it and you pray it and you have that assurance that I have it. And once you have that assurance, that power will start to take over you. And mine happened, I think you've heard my story. Mine happened because an Air Force captain came into my office and said, Sergeant Lay, yes, sir, I hear you're a Christian. Yes, sir, why aren't you living like one? And I got filled because I went all in with Jesus. Mine was a personal experience, so I'm going to let you have a personal experience right now. You don't need to come forward. You don't have to have somebody lay hands on you. you can, it's between you and the Lord. Can I get some keys? Go ahead, let's get some keys going here. First, you make a need to make a declaration of surrender to Christ. Sometime during the worship we're about to have, I want you to raise your hand where you're at. I'm not going to count to three. This is salvation. This is just you and the Lord. And this is going to be you showing the Lord that you really want the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. And you're just going to, sometime during worship, you're just going to raise your hand and you're going to go, Lord, I want it. I want it. And it's not for us. Nobody's going to know if you raise your hand. It's because you want to be serious with Jesus now. You're sick of playing these games. You don't want to go back to your old way of life. You want to live in this victory that we're talking about. Then you're going to repent of your sins. Pastor Susanna talked about repentance. You've got to admit, you messed up. If you hear me preaching, all of us say, you messed up. You messed up. It's called sin. You shouldn't be doing that in front of a computer screen. You shouldn't be sleeping with that guy. You shouldn't be sneaking that alcohol and going out and getting drunk and doing those things. You shouldn't be cheating on your exams. You shouldn't be stealing from your employer. You shouldn't. You know you've been doing wrong, and you're going to repent right now and say, Lord, I have sinned against you, and I turn from my sins, and I am coming clean before you right now. Because you can't get filled. The Lord does not fill a dirty vessel. He won't. you got to confess and admit that sin. But, and this is why I love being a Christian, woo! <laughs> then you accept the blood of Jesus Christ that you're forgiven. So many of you are stuck in self-hatred right now. You are stuck in the lies of the world and it's made you hate yourself. That's why you're depressed. That's why you can't have victory because you don't think you're worthy enough. And God is saying, I bled for you. I died for you. You want to know how much I love you? I did everything and sacrificed everything so I could have a relationship with you. And not only that, Jesus says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. So where I am, you will be with me. He's going to take us into his kingdom. That's the marriage. I love my wife, but honey, you ain't nothing like that. I mean, I can't wait for that. I mean, I love my wife, but she's here. Jesus is here because I've accepted his forgiveness and I'm a new creation in Christ 
And you can be a new creation if you accept the forgiveness that comes in the blood of Jesus Christ. Are you willing to accept the forgiveness and become a new creation in Christ? And if that is you and you've accepted Christ but you haven't been living like it, this is where you have to accept a new forgiveness. That even as a Christian and you're sinning, he's willing to forgive you and start over again and fill you with the Holy Spirit. And then once you repent and accept the forgiveness in the blood of Jesus Christ during worship, you need to ask for the baptism and filling of the Holy Spirit. And what that means is just simply you just say, Lord, I believe your word. Jesus says, if you fathers know how to give good gifts to your children, being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Have you ever asked for the power of the Holy Spirit to fill your life? If not, tonight's your night. And you don't quit praying and you don't quit until you have that assurance that he's heard. And the peace comes and how you'll know it. And this is where it gets weird, okay? You ready for the weird part? Because God does some weird things. Let's face it, God's not weird, but he does some weird. I mean, a guy getting swallowed by a fish, that's weird. Telling a guy to lay on his side for years and cook food over poop, that's weird. If you don't know the story of the prophets, he does some weird things. This is a weird moment. I love what Jesus says in John. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. The one who believes in me, as the scripture says, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. There's going to be something welling up inside of you. There's going to be something inside of you. It's called the Holy Spirit. Because if you're a Christian, you've received the Holy Spirit, but you haven't let him out. You haven't let him fill you. It's kind of like this illustration. You drank water and he got into you, but he isn't controlling you. What you need to do is get immersed. You need to do baptism of the Holy Spirit. In other words, you're going to dive into the water. And when you dive into the water, now the water controls you. The water controls your breathing. The water controls your movement. The Holy Spirit wants to control you. And what you're going to do is let the Holy Spirit who's inside you start well up and in your praise you're going to just realize that he is there and he's giving you the power and by faith you're going to praise him and faith you're going to proclaim it don't leave until you have it would you lead us you know what to do I'll help you I'll keep up here and talk it through but let's worship right now
you're forgiven. He's forgiven that abortion right now. He's forgiven that premarital sex right now. He's forgiven that lying right now. He's forgiven it. The blood is washed it clean. Accept the forgiveness. Worship is a clean person right now. Worship is a clean, holy vessel before the Lord. And then after that, let the Holy Spirit come upon you. Father God, I pray right now, fire. I pray fire in Jesus' name to fall upon these people, Lord. I pray you would well up your Holy Spirit inside them and give them the power you promised. You are not a liar, God. You are not a liar. So we are asking, Lord, for a fresh filling. Lord, we are asking for a filling of the Holy Spirit. Will you hear the cries of your people and proclaim the promise over them, Lord, that you promised. So God, we believe, we believe, we believe, and we worship you. We worship you. We worship you right now. Oh.